Hello. So now at this point we are entering into a new major section in the book of Jeremiah. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, Jeremiah is extremely difficult to try to create an orderly outline of, of the book. Um, it, uh, it just kind of defies some of our attempts to identify a, a single coherent structure. Um, so, uh, that being said, as I'm introducing this new section, you'll notice that it it is uh, different than the the outline that's given in the primary commentary, this, this commentary on Jeremiah and Lamentations. Um, no one is really in entire agreement, I mean, basically, for the structure of Jeremiah. Um, I think t- chapters 2 through 25 present overall um, a, a very harsh message of judgment of, that God has against his people and Judah. Um, he's confronting largely um, uh, the monarchy. He's confronting, you know, the evil that is that is present there. Um, he's he's predicting exile and judgment. Now, when we get into chapter twenty six and beyond, we still do get a lot of that harsh judgment. But now um, we're going to start to see a little bit more hope woven into. Um, into the uh, the passages, especially when we get to the so-called Book of Consolation, um, but this these four chapters here, I think, comprise kind of a mini section within the Book of Jeremiah um, that I've just labeled it's Jeremiah and the false prophets. Um, so there's definitely going to be some direct confrontation that the prophet has with these with these so-called false prophets. And if you'll remember, we learned a little bit about the difference between a court prophet and a free prophet. And I think that's a little bit of the dynamic that's at play here. Jeremiah is functioning as a free prophet. And, um, you know, the court prophets who are kind of, um, you know, part of the monarchy propaganda machine, um, you know, really trying to prop up and support the monarchy, um, Jeremiah is going to be in direct confrontation with them. So this is, again, four chapters. Um, I've given you the basic outline. First, in chapter 26, um, we're, it's a, you know, looking at the temple sermon again. The temple sermon, you remember, that was from chapter 7 of Jeremiah. A very significant passage. He's, he's dealing with the inviability of, like this, this of the temple, this idea that the temple um, and and Jerusalem could never be destroyed, um, and so Jeremiah is dealing with that. But we get more of the reaction to this to this uh, sermon <clears throat> in this passage. Um, in chapter seven, you get more of the sermon itself. If these are in fact the same event, personally, I think that they probably are. But there's some disagreement about that as well. Um, and then chapter 27, Jeremiah's warning against a, against a coalition against Babylon. Um, in chapter 28, Jeremiah and Hananiah are going to be in some direct conflict with one another. And then chapter 29, which uh, most people know at least part of that, um, we have Jeremiah sending a letter to the exiles in which he's uh, addressing some false prophecies that they've been they've been hearing. And so he's going to be um, speaking against that. So uh, with that, I want to read a little bit of Jeremiah chapter 26, and we can see how he's, you know, this, the temple sermon, um, you know, it's placed here for literary reasons, I think. Um, and it, it makes a theological statement, I think, you know, with, with what's happening here. So we're going to look at that passage. All right, so here we are. Maybe I can make that a little bit bigger so it's easier to read. Okay, so we begin um, in chapter 26, verse 1. It says, In the beginning of the reign of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, this word came from the Lord, saying... Now, we recognize this as... um, Again, it's an editorial marker. Um, It's introducing a new section... 
new series of prophecies here, just like we've seen before, the word of the Lord, the word came from the Lord to Jeremiah, um, etc. Um, we have this, this terminology here. If you do know a little bit of Hebrew, we have this here that says Bereshit. Um, and if you know, that is the opening word of Genesis in the beginning. Bereshit, Mamalkuth, um, this is like this is like a technical designation of when a king would ascend the throne. Um, it wouldn't necessarily happen at the beginning of the year. Um, it would there would be this time, and so when you count the first year of their reign, sometimes you have this time between when they ascend to the throne, the ascension, and then when their first official year begins and this is in that in between time so this is somewhere around 609 um, six maybe you know could be in 608 because uh, if you remember Josiah dies 609 Jehoahaz is king for um, uh, for uh, three months and then Jehoiakim becomes king after him after uh, when um, when Egypt, exiles Jehoahaz and Jehoiakim, they install him as the new king. So the new year would have begun at this time. Uh, they would have counted the beginning of the new year in fall, so like September maybe, um, early fall. So this is sometime before, you know, beginning in 609, but before 608 uh, in September of 608. Um, that's the time frame that we're, we're dealing with. So this word of the Lord comes, and then it says, this is what the Lord says, verse 2, stand in the courtyard of the Lord's house and speak to all the cities of Judah who have come to worship in the Lord's house all the words that I have commanded you to speak to them. Do not omit a word. So there's God's instructions to Jeremiah. He's, he's instructed here. He's going to stand um, in the courtyard of the Lord's house. So a public place, uh, people are gathering, you know, all the cities of Judah. So um, we're, we're probably looking at one of the pilgrimage festivals. Um, you know, I, I'm thinking maybe this is Passover. Um, you know, there's, there's the three festivals that the people are commanded to um, journey to to Jerusalem and and journey um, to uh, to the temple to worship for three pilgrimage festivals um, there's Passover there is a feast of Pentecost and the feast of tabernacles um, these three and if it was the feast of Passover um, you know Josiah had just died and he reinstituted you know some of these things and also reinstituted this public reading of of Torah. So you would have the Torah read every year at the Feast of Passover. And so um, this quite possibly is that occasion. So all the people are, are gathered here um, for this for this particular occasion. Again, uh, you'll have a lot of people who think that this is probably the same occasion as um, as uh, the, the chapter 7 temple sermon. Um, and you'll notice, like, we're not dealing in chronological order here in the book of Jeremiah because, you know, Jehoiakim, this is relatively, I mean, this is the beginning of Jehoiakim's reign, 609. Uh, we still got a ways to go until the final uh, destruction of, of the temple and of Jerusalem. So uh, definitely not in chronological order here. Um, and and now we're going to we're gonna kind of look at this again from a different perspective. And so God, you know, gives them these instructions. This is where you're supposed to stand and do not omit a word. So this is, I mean, that's referring to God's God's command to Jeremiah. He's commanded him, you're going to go stand. Um, we don't know necessarily that we have an exact transcript here. Um, so we don't need to get worried about that. It was for that particular occasion, Jeremiah, we assume, did not omit a word of what God commanded him. And now we have a report of this. This is another thing you're going to see here. Um, th th there's going to be a, a little bit of a shift in the, these sections from um, Jeremiah 
Uh, like the the text being in first person to kind of more being in the third person narrative account. Um, and we're also going to see some other characters being introduced in the second half of the book of Jeremiah, including, you know, Baruch, Evan Lamelech, and some other some other people. So it'll be it'll be interesting. All right, let me scroll down here. So verse three. Um, Perhaps they will listen and everyone will turn from his evil way and I will relent of the disaster which I am planning to inflict on them because of the evil of their deeds. Um, So, okay. So we have like this kind of introductory summary here. Um, You know, God wants Jeremiah to speak his words to the people. Um, Perhaps they will repent. Um, Otherwise... God's going to punish them, okay? Um, and it says here, okay, let me let me take a look here. Um, you know, this is saying that perhaps everyone will turn. So this is a, a Hebrew term for repentance. There's a few different words that are used for repentance. One is, oops. Here we go. Oh, sorry, one second. Let me fix this. One second. All right, I think I have this fixed. So this word, you know, it says perhaps everyone will turn from his evil way. Uh, perhaps they will listen and turn. This is the Hebrew word shuv. Okay, you can put it out there. This be spelled something like that. Shuv. Um, this this means to literally um, like. You're going in one direction, and you've you've done a 180, and now you're going in the other direction. It's used metaphorically, prominently, very very prominently um, within the book of Jeremiah. Um, there's actually been um, some pretty significant studies on this term of how it's used um, within the book of Jeremiah, and this is describing the the shuv, the 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 people need to turn back from the evil that they're doing and go in the opposite direction um, and following God. So this actually, um, within your, your commentary, you hopefully read in the introduction, the commentary that you're reading, there's a whole section in here just on the the use of this word shuv within the book of Jeremiah. So now it says, perhaps the people will listen and they will turn, they will shuv. um, And then it says, and I will relent. Um, This is a different Hebrew word. This is... Naham. Okay. Um, the idea of this is like more the feeling of, of being sorry, like regretting something. Um, you know, you, you've done something and then you feel bad about it and now you've, you're changing your mind. Um, translated here as, as relent. Um, I think you could probably translate it, um, and I will, um, I will feel bad and change my mind about the disaster. Sometimes this is, you know, almost translated and in, in the sense of, of to regret. Now this this kind of brings up, you know, some earlier themes that we talked about. This idea, well, does God change His mind? Um, you know, is it appropriate to talk about God in that way? Um, does God change? Um, you know, we sing songs like, you know, the old hymn, but, you know, thou changest not thy compassions, they fail not. And sometimes people get this idea that God is this sort of static, immovable force. Whereas the reality of what we see in scripture is actually, it's a lot more beautiful than that because we see God in this dynamic relationship with his people. Um, you know, uh, you know, God says, um, many times that he would love 
to turn from punishing his people. He would love to not punish his people if only they would repent. Um, God would love to, you know, he, there's always that, you know, that um, uh, unless clause, you know, I'm going to punish you unless you repent. And then God does, in fact, change his mind. So it's a much more beautiful picture than this sort of static, you know, platonic idea of God as just this sort of um, immovable force uh, that we have to reckon with. So I just want to want to point that out here. Um, God, Yahweh, wants to have mercy. He wants to have compassion on his people. Um, but his people must turn from their, you know, literally turn from their evil ways. Okay? Now, continuing in verse 4 here, uh, reads, And you shall say to them, This is what the Lord says. If you do not listen to me, to walk in my law, which I have set before you, uh, continuing to listen to the words of my servants, the prophets, whom I have been sending to you again and again, but you have not listened, then I will make this house like Shiloh, and I will make this city a curse to all the nations of the earth. Okay, let's unpack a little bit of what's going on here. Um, now, he begins, you know, if you do not listen to me. I'll highlight the word here. So if you do not listen to me. So I'm going to be bringing out some more Hebrew terms just kind of help us appreciate sort of the character of what's happening here. So this is the Hebrew word, and maybe you've heard this, Shema, okay? Um, the Let me spell it just the normal. Shema, okay, whoops. <laughs> Sorry, I, I misspelled it. Sorry, it's sometimes I forget my transliteration. I'm not very good at. Okay, Shema. Um, so this is, you, you might have heard this from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. Um, that begins with, you know, the hear, O Israel, the command to hear or to listen is this Hebrew word Shema. Um, this would have been, I mean, that is a prayer that, that every Israelite would have had memorized. Hear, O Israel. I mean, that's like a central confession. Um, but the word Shema actually kind of has, you know, uh, dual meanings here. And it's translated different, different ways depending on context. Um, now, we want to be sensitive to context. Absolutely. Of course, we've talked a little bit about semantics, um, and, you know, in, in relation to doing a word study. Um, but this is more of a sense of to hear or to listen, but then also to obey. Okay, this is the idea of like you're hearing something, but it's taking root inside of you and you're obeying it, you're following in it. And the context here, I think this is kind of what we're getting because it says, if you do not listen to me to walk in my law. So that that word walk this is you know that's um uh you know used metaphorically to describe how how people are living in accordance with something um to to walk according to the law is to live your life in obedience to the law so here he's saying if you do not listen to me not just to hear me but if you do not really obey me to follow to walk in um you know, it says, my law. Okay, right over here. This is Torah. That's the word, to walk in Torah. Now, Torah is um, probably not uh, best translated most of the time as law. Um, the idea of Torah is really, it's instruction. It's, it's God's instruction. Um, now, in this particular case, He's probably, you know, pointing to, because you have, like, you have Torah, which some people are referring to, 
you know, the whole of the first of the books of Moses as Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Only a small part of that is actually laws. Um, but the idea is that this is all instruction for you of, of how you're supposed to live your life. Um, now he's saying, if you do not obey, if you do not, you know, walk in, live your life in accordance to my instruction. And he probably has some um, eye towards covenant stipulations, this I, you know, idea that there are certain things you're supposed to do, certain things you're not supposed to do. Um, you know, if you do not obey, if you do not, you know, s- live your life in accordance with the law, um, of course, it's the law that's been set before you. Um, then, you know, eventually we get down to verse 6, I will make this place like Shiloh. He says, you know, to listen to, you know, it's this continuation, to listen to, in verse 5, the words of my servants, the prophets, who have been sending to you. And again, here's that that idiom I've mentioned before again and again. Literally, it's, you know, God has been rising early and doing this. That's, that's the idea, is that this is... Um, just showing God's passion. Like, when you say rising early to do something, it means like you're so eager. It's like you're getting ready to go on a trip and you just, you can't sleep. You got to get up early to go do the thing. You know, Christmas morning, you're not sleeping in till 9, 10 o'clock. You're waking up at the crack of dawn because you can't wait to go downstairs and open your, you know, celebrate and all those things. And here God is so eager to reach his people. He's rising early and sending prophets. He, he just can't wait to get started um, because he wants to reach his people. Okay? Um, okay. So now Jeremiah has this reference to Shiloh, which people have, you know, connected this again with the Temple Sermon in chapter 7. Um but now this is a much more abbreviated form. He's not, you know, we're not getting all of the same speech that we got in chapter 7 because now what's going to happen is we're going to turn to the reaction of some of the people who are listening. So this, um, in this part, we read that the priests and the prophets and all the people heard Jeremiah speaking these words in the house of the Lord. Um, so notice specifically um, there's an emphasis that the religious leaders are being highlighted here, specifically priests and prophets. And then you also have all the people, you know, everyone, the whole congregation, everyone who's gathered there, um, and emphasize that this is, again, in the house of the Lord. Yet, when Jeremiah finished speaking everything that the Lord had commanded him to speak to, to all the people, then the priests and the prof- and the prophets and all the people seized him, saying, you must die. Um, so, you know, this is um, this this term that's being used for seize. This is similar to how, you know, in Deuteronomy, people are commanded that when, when someone transgresses the commandments, when someone breaks the law, you're supposed to seize them. You're supposed to grab a hold of them uh, in order to be able to punish them. But now here we have Jeremiah is announcing the words of the law, but yet, you know, he's announcing, I mean, because this is all what he's saying is is contained within within the law, within Deuteronomy. And now the people are instead seizing him. Um, so there's this sort of reversal. Um, and, you know, this... You know this uh, this phrase. You must die. Um, I mean, this is an emphatic expression from the people, and it's a twisting of of you know Torah. I mean, this was something that was a punishment for when someone transgressed certain you know grievous laws within the covenant. And now here you have the prophet proclaiming the law. You know, telling people to turn back, walk in the law, you know, as God has commanded his people to walk in the in accords, live their life in accordance with the law. And now they're saying, you must die. Um, and so then we have, let's see, verse 9. Um, Why have you prophesied in the name of Yahweh? 
Why have you prophesied in the name of the Lord, saying, This house will be like Shiloh, and this city will be in ruins without an inhabitant? And all the people gathered to Jeremiah at the house of the Lord. So they're they're questioning him. See, and and their in their eyes, Jeremiah is guilty. He's guilty because he predicted that Jerusalem would become like Shiloh, which they believed could never happen. Again, there was this concept, this was a major theological belief, a false theological belief that the people held during this time, that there was this inviability of Jerusalem, this inviability of the temple, that it could never be destroyed, no matter how bad things got, no matter, um, you know, no matter what they did, God caused his name to dwell there, and this could never fall. Um, and then since they think that he, it's, um, you know, they think this must be a false prophecy then, because he's violating something that they strongly believe, um, they then would deem it a false prophecy, and he is claiming to speak in Yahweh's name. So now he's, he's also guilty of that as well, for false prophecy. Um, it's kind of the two things uh, coming together here. So, continue here. Um, you know, Jeremiah, this is more about the reaction again. So, in verse 10, when the officials of Judah heard these things, they came up from the king's house to the house of the Lord and sat at the entrance of the new gate of the Lord's house. Then the priests and the prophets spoke to the officials and to all the people, saying, A death sentence for this man, for he has prophesied against the city, just as you have heard with your own ears. So the court officials hear these things, and they convene kind of a trial. Um, You know, Jeremiah is, you know, in a sense, he's not going to die in the mob rule of the moment, of the people just seizing him and just saying, you must die, and that they're just going to, you know, stone him right then and there. You know, the... the, um, the officials, um, let's see, the officials of Judah in verse 10 heard these things. They came from the king's house to the house of the Lord, which is just, you know, further up the hill there from where they were. Um, you know, not not very far. If you look at a map of Jerusalem, you can see, you know, where the king's house was in relation to the temple. And so here these officials come, and they're not on Jeremiah's side, but they're at least, you know, trying to convene sort of a trial you know, they the they heard the commotion, or maybe someone was sent um, for them, and you know they they say we need to you know this this man needs to die because of this. Um, so then Jeremiah gets uh, let's see in verse eleven, then verse twelve. Let's see, Jeremiah he gets to kind of give a, a defense. Simply that he's sent by Yahweh. Jeremiah spoke to all the officials and to all the people, saying, The Lord sent me to prophesy against this house and against the city all the words that you have heard. His, de- his defense is very simple. You know, just, yeah, I am prophesying in God's name because I am sent by God. That's that messenger formula at work again. His words are not his own, but they come, in fact, from Yahweh. So then he continues, Now then, reform your ways and your deeds and obey the voice of the Lord your God. Um, So here's that word, now translated obey. This is the same word that we have here, Shema. Um, Now then, reform your ways and your deeds and hear the voice of the Lord your God. Obey the voice of the Lord your God and the Lord will relent move the mouse over and then here's that word naham again at work here and the lord will relent of the disaster which he has pronounced against you okay so it's the basic message you know change your ways change what you're doing and yes god does in fact change his mind he will he will feel sorry he'll have compassion on you um But as for me, in verse 14, But as for me, behold, I am in your hands. Do with me as is good and right in your sight. So he's submitting to their judgment. But, verse 15, Only know for certain that if you put me to death, 
you will bring innocent blood on yourselves and on the city and its inhabitants. For truly the Lord has sent me to you to speak all these words so that you hear them. So he maintains his innocence and he, you know, he's saying, you know, I was sent in fact by God. Then verse 16, okay, we have the the acquittal. Then the officials and all the people said to the priests and the prophets, no death sentence for this man, for he has spoken to us in the name of the Lord our God. So they don't like his message, but they're at least willing to say, okay, he's claiming to speak in God's name. That's, you know, they have to, they have to deal with this. Um, he's acquitted, you know, basically on, on the basis of his, of his own defense. Okay. Then, verse 17, then some of the elders of the land rose up and spoke to all the assembly of the people, saying, okay, now we have a little bit of a different, you know, input here, saying, Micah of Morasheth. So now this is the same Micah that we have, the book of Micah from the Minor Prophets. Um, Micah of Morasheth used to prophesy in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah. So Hezekiah... Um, this is going back um, to the early, or I should say the late 700s, okay? This is the 8th century. Um, very famous, there was the so-called Siege of Sennacherib. Sennacherib was one of the great um, rulers, leaders of um, the, the empire of Assyria. And in 701, he marched against Jerusalem, laid siege to it. I mean, that was, I mean, that wasn't the only time that Assyria had, um, you know, had invaded Judah. That was a very significant one. So Micah Morasheth, this is in the late 700s, you know, right around that time. It says the days of King um, Hezekiah. Hezekiah, there's a bit of contention over when he became king. Um, it might have been about the year 716. Um I won't get into the debate right now, but he used to prophesy in the days of Hezekiah, king of Judah, and he spoke to all the people of Judah, saying, this is what the Lord of armies says. So he's, again, they're recalling, do you remember how Micah, he also prophesied, um, you know, in the days of in the days of a previous king? Let's look at history as an example. And he quotes here uh, from Micah chapter 3, whoops, there we go. Quotes here from uh, Micah chapter 3, and he said, Zion will be plowed like a field, and Jerusalem will become heaps of ruins, and the mountain of the house like the high places of the forest. Okay, so now they're saying, Micah, we all accept him as a prophet. Um, that he, in fact, prophesied in God's name uh, and was a true prophet, and he prophesied the similar kind of disaster that Zion, you know, the holy city, Jerusalem, would be destroyed, would be plowed like a field, you know, totally raised like a heap of ruins. And even the mountain of the house, that is the temple, becomes like, you know, it says the high places of a forest. In other words, it's, you know, it's just been turned into rubble and wilderness. And now, now, how did Hezekiah react in verse 19? Did Hezekiah, king of Judah, and all Judah actually put him to death? Did he not fear the Lord? You know, Hezekiah, did he not fear the Lord and plead for the favor of the Lord? And the Lord relented, that word relented again, the Lord relented of the disaster which he had pronounced against them. But we are committing a great evil against our own lives. So Hezekiah, I mean, it's an interesting thing because you have... Um, you know, Hezekiah provides a model example of how to respond in the, you know, the face of a prophecy like this. Hezekiah turned to God. He, he went in and he, he prostrated himself before God. I mean, he, he went into fasting and he really sought God to relent, have mercy. And because of that, God did, in fact, have mercy, and it's, it was a great, miraculous deliverance for the people. Now, here Jeremiah is coming, you know, at a later time, you know, almost 100 years later, and he's giving a similar message. Um, 
you know, the idea is that should the people repent in a similar way, in the same way, God will again relent, have mercy. Okay? And then verse 20, it says, Indeed, there was also a man who used to prophesy in the name of the Lord, Uriah the son of Shemaiah from Kiriath-Jerim, and he prophesied against the city and against this land, words similar to all those of Jeremiah. So, I mean, here's that, Again and again, God sent his prophets. And, you know, they're, these people are remembering, well, Jeremiah is not the first one to do this. Um, now, notice here that um, this is no longer quoting... This is no longer quoting the elders. This is almost like um, a story inserted by the editors of the book. Like they added, like, you know, the elders quoted this, and at some point an editor came along and said, hey, there's another one. Let's insert this this verse in there, verse 19. Um, okay, or sorry, verse 20. When King Jehoiakim... And all his warriors and all the officials heard his words. Then the king sought to put him to death, but Uriah heard about it, and he was afraid, so he fled and went to Egypt. Then King Jehoiakim sent men to Egypt, Elnathan, the son of Akbor, and certain men with him to Egypt, and they brought Uriah from Egypt and led him to King Jehoiakim, who killed him with a sword and threw his dead body into the burial place of the common people. So this is a this is a contrast, you know, a similar story of someone who's prophesying something similarly, but then we see um, Uriah was not spared. Fortunately, Jeremiah is spared. Um, you know, this is helping us to get a better sense of the real danger, the real threat that Jeremiah faced. You know, he's he's you know understood to be someone who suffers great, a prophet who suffers greatly. This is kind of what he's up against. Um, okay. Um, let's go ahead and we'll stop there. That was through all of, of chapter 26. Um, and we'll look at some other passages again in a different lecture. Okay. Thank you.